In this video, I'm going to talk about particular features of the intervertebral joint and the intervertebral disc of the lumbar spine. Hi and welcome back to PhysioTutors. As we saw in our video about the vertebral bodies, their only function due to their flat form is to bear axial load. In order to accommodate rocking movements like flexion, extension and lateral bending, we need strong but deformable structures in between, the intervertebral discs. If we look at the internal structure of an intervertebral disc, we see two basic components, the nucleus pulposus and the annulus fibrosus. On top of both of those two structures, we find two layers of cartilage called the vertebral end plates. In healthy adults, the nucleus is a semi-fluid mass of mucoid material, much like toothpaste. Its fluid-like nature lets it be deformed, but its volume cannot be compressed. You can imagine it like a balloon filled with water. Compression of the balloon deforms it and stretches the outer walls of the balloon in all directions. If we look at the annulus fibrosus from the top, we can see that it consists out of 10 to 20 sheets that are arranged around the nucleus and they are called the lamellae. They are somewhat thicker towards the center of the disc and anteriorly and laterally. So posteriorly they are somewhat finer and more tightly packed and the whole annulus posteriorly is thinner than the rest. The lamellae are actually not continuous like I drew it here and in around 40% of the cases, especially in the middle portion of the annulus, they might fuse with superficial or deeper lamellae. Within a lamellae, the collagen fibers run parallel to each other with an orientation of 65 to 70 degrees from vertical. The orientation of the fibers change within each lamellae. So the underlying lamellae of the one that we just drew will have inclined collagen fibers that are angled 65 to 70 degrees in the opposite direction. So like this and so on. The vertebral end plates right here and here are cartilage layer with a thickness of 0.6 millimeters to a millimeter and they cover the vertebral body which is encircled by the apophysis right here and here. The fibers of the innermost two-thirds of the annulus sweep around the vertebral end plate while the peripheral fibers anchor into the bone of the apophysis. So like you can see here, the outer one-third anchors into the bone and the inner two-thirds sweep around the whole nucleus and the vertebral end plates right here. So you can see that the end plates are firmly attached to the intervertebral disc while the attachment is weak between the apophysis and the annulus, which is why during trauma the end plates can be torn from the intervertebral bodies. One class of chemicals that are found in nearly all forms of connective tissues are the so-called glucosaminoglycans, abbreviated as GAGs. They are two sugar molecules bound with an amine, which form a repeating unit. And they usually form long chains with 20 repeating units. So the gags would basically be long chains with up to 20 repeating units. We also draw it here. If we zoom out a bit, then we can see that many gags are attached to a polypeptide chain known as the core protein. And so if we draw the core protein right here, protein we get a, a big molecule that is called a, a proteoglycan and a proteoglycan can carry up up to 60 gags so the whole thing is called a proteo glycan. In real life these chains form complex three-dimensional structures like shown here. It is important to note that the gag chains are negatively charged so they are basically 
negatively charged everywhere. And because of this negative charge, they attract water, which is positively charged. So around those gags, we would have H2O everywhere. And so on. So while we would call this structure a proteoglycan unit, a proteoglycan unit can also bind with hyaluronic acid, which is also a chain right here. And they bind with the help of the so-called link protein right here. That's a link protein. And then you will have a lot of proteoglycan units that attach to the hyaluronic acid. So right here we could have another proteoglycan unit with the gags right here as well. And so on. And this huge new structure would be called a proteoglycan aggregate. Then we have another fundamental structure in our soft tissues, which are strands of protein molecules. And these are the collagen fibers. We have 11 different types of collagen fibers in total. And in our case, it's important to look at type 1 and 2. Type 1 is tensile in nature and subjected to tension and compression. And it can mainly be found in skin, bone, tendon and, for example, the meniscus. And more important in our case, it can especially be found in the annulus fibrosus, or AF. Type 2 collagen is more elastic and typically found in tissues that are exposed to pressure, for example, cartilage, right here. And in our case, it's important to realize that uh, the type 2 collagen fibers are mainly found in the nucleus pulposus. Now, remember the proteoglycans from earlier? They can bond together with collagen and together they make up the strength of our intervertebral disc. Let's look at the microstructure of an intervertebral disc. The nucleus pulposus contains 70 to 90 percent water. And from the dry weight, 65 percent are proteoglycans. Of these 65%, only 25% occur in an aggregated form bound to hyaluronic acid. Collagen fibers type 2 make up another 15-20% to 20 of the dry weight. Type the mix of proteoglycan units, aggregates and collagen fibers together are called the matrix of the nucleus. We can also find cartilage cells at the region of the end plates which are responsible for the synthesis of proteoglycans and collagen. In the annulus we still find 60-70% of water. And we can find around 20% of proteoglycans of which 50 to 60% are in an aggregated form. At last, collagen makes up 50 to 60% of the dry weight. And remember, in the annulus, we mainly have type 1 collagen fibers. The closer you go towards the nucleus, the more proteoglycans can be found and the less collagen will be contained. The chemical structure of the vertebral end plates resemble that of the rest of the disc, with a higher amount 
in concentration of water and proteoglycans in the middle and more collagen on the outer region of the annulus. A few words about the metabolism of an intervertebral disc. The proteoglycans and collagen are synthesized by chondrocytes and fibroplasts, but the turnover of the matrix is slow. This is due to the fact that the disc lacks blood supply and thus oxygen and completely depends on diffusion. The oxygen concentrations in the middle of the disc are only 2-5% of those of the outer region and therefore the metabolism is anaerobic. At last we can see how the disc functions based on the detailed structure of the intervertebral disc that we just reviewed. Both the nucleus and the annulus fibrosus are involved in weight bearing. The annulus fibrosus is relatively stiff and can bear weight much like a book that is wrapped in cylindrical form unless it does not buckle. While the annulus can sustain a lot of weight in brief loads, the problem is that it is squashed by sustained loads and water will be squeezed out of it, which reduces its height. So therefore an additional form of bracing is required which is provided by the nucleus. The nucleus may be deformed under pressure but its volume can't be compressed. So this pressure is exerted radially onto the annulus. Right here. The tension in the annulus is exerted back to the nucleus, preventing it from expanding radially and the nucleus passes on the pressure to the vertebral end plates. So we have tension in the annulus fibrosus and this tension is passed on to the nucleus again and the nucleus passes it on to the vertebral end plates. So what the nucleus does is that it creates an equilibrium of pressure between the annulus and the end plates. In this way the annulus is prevented from buckling and the pressure on the end plates is transmitted to the next vertebrae. As soon as the pressure is released, the stored energy in the nucleus helps to restore any deformities that it might have undergone. This is only possible due to the presence of proteoglycans that bind water and the tensile properties of type 1 collagen fibers in the annulus. Ultimately, this mechanism protects its underlying vertebrae by slowing down the rate of force which is transmitted to that vertebrae. So let's look at distractions. During distraction, all points of one vertebrae move an equal distance away from the other vertebrae. So all collagen fibers in the annulus are stretched to the same amount and restrict distraction to the same amount. So all fibers that go into this direction are stretched to the same amount as well as the ones that go into the other direction. If we look at sliding, all the points of the interbody joint move an equal distance parallel to the upper surface of the underlying vertebrae. In this case, only the fibers that lie in the direction of movement resist the movement and are stretched, while the other fibers are relaxed. So, if we move into this direction, only the fibers that lie into this direction will be stretched and resist the movement. And the other fibers that lie into this direction will actually be relaxed because their points of attachment are approximated. Mostly the resistance comes from the lateral fibers while the anterior and posterior fibers contribute only to a small extent because the movement is not in the direction of their fiber orientation. For twisting movements the story is basically the same, so only the fibers that lie in the direction of the twist are stretched and resist the movements, while the other fibers that lie in the other direction are approximated and relax. So only half of the fibers of the annulus resist twisting, which is one of the reasons why twisting movements are the most likely to injure the annulus. In forward bending we can see that the anterior nucleus will be compressed and tends to buckle uh, while the pressure on the nucleus is relieved posteriorly 
and the posterior annulus here is stretched. So while there is a small amount of increased disc pressure with bending, especially on the load, the largest increase comes from additional compressive loads by the action of the back muscles that control the bending. In a hernia, the posterior lamellae are weakened due to disc disease or injury and increased posterior pressure during bending might rupture the remaining lamellae and the nucleus extrudes. In humans, we can find two different disc shapes, a more kidney shaped disc right here and a more elliptical disc. If a disc is more concave posteriorly, here on the left, rather than elliptical, the posterior portion of the annulus is greater and is better able to resist posterior stretch during forward bending. Okay, this is the end of a somewhat longer video about the interbody joints and the intervertebral disc. I hope everything was clear for you guys. If you still have any questions, feel free to uh, just drop a comment and give this video a like if it was helpful to you. Subscribe to our channel if you haven't. Check us out on Instagram, Facebook and on our webpage physiotutors.com. This was Kai for Physiotutors and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.